Okay, so let us continue where we left off. Uh, if you recall uh, in the last class, I was uh, telling you about how it is possible to introduce a source. Uh, that means you pretend that there is an external potential which depends on time, but that time, all those times are on the imaginary axis, you know, between uh, t equal to 0 and t equals minus i beta h bar. Then what you do is that you define your Green's function along the time ordered Green's function al uh, with times ordered along this imaginary axis in between in, within this interval. So then uh, it is possible to write down uh, the equation of motion that is basically the, uh, the time dependence, the how does Green's function changes with. Uh, uh, see one of those times, see after all uh, the, uh, the Green's function depends on two times, it depends on the uh, time of the first operator which is usually the annihilation operator. So remember that what this Green's function is, it is basically the uh, time ordered, it's, so it is time ordered along the imaginary axis, so I will put C there just to remind myself that it is along the imaginary axis and this is what it is. So I have just picked one of the times and I have decided to uh, find the time evolution uh, with respect to that particular time which is uh, just I have just selected, I could have selected T2 also, but I have selected T1. So the point is that uh, the equation obeyed by uh, this Green's function is uh, going to be this. Okay, uh, yeah, so this typically comes with a minus i also. Okay, so uh, yeah, because if it comes with a minus i, then this becomes. You see, this is shorthand for uh, a spatial and time Dirac delta function multiplied together. This is, I mean, this is just shorthand of writing. It's not uh, uh, the number one minus number two. It's not like one minus two equals minus one. I mean, one means one means x one t one. 2 means x2 t2, so it is just shorthand because I have to otherwise write x1 comma t1, x2 comma t2, it is very irritating. But here I have no choice, I have to explicitly write r1, r2 or whatever, r1, r2, so I have to explicitly write that here, okay. Yeah, it is not x1, I have selected r1, r2, r1 comma t1 is shorthand for that is 1, r2 comma t2 shorthand is 2. So, uh, so the point is that the equation of motion obeyed by the Green's function is basically this. So now you see this involves uh, two creation and two annihilation operators, isn't it? So, uh, but then I told you that uh, the whole purpose of introducing this uh, external time dependent potential which is uh, anyway not there and uh, you know trying to complicate matters by introducing something that is not there, uh, it had better have a valid uh, benefit that is if it, uh, if it does not benefit me enormously, I have no business complicating matters by introducing something that did not exist before. So you will soon see that it is in fact very, very useful. So the reason why it is useful is that if you take this Green's function and formally differentiate with respect to the source that I have introduced. So what is going to happen is that you will see that, uh, you see after all the source is present only in the S matrix and uh, if you recall this S matrix is defined like this. So the source is only here. So if I differentiate with respect to the source, I will bring down a density there which is precisely what this uh, term which involves four fermions uh, interaction is, okay. So basically uh, you see it involves uh, the density here, so it involves this is the density here, C dagger R dash T1, C R dash T1, that is basically the density. So by differentiating with respect to the source of the Green's function, so this is the original Green's function. R1, T1, R2, T2, uh, R1, T1 is annihilation, R2, T2 is creation. But now I want to uh, see how I can bring down a density. So if, if it is just this, there is nothing there. So I have to difference, so if there is an S there, you see the S has a density in the exponent. If I differentiate with respect to 
uh, the source I will be bringing down at density, but then uh, you see the, the Green's function is the ratio of uh, the S matrix on the numerator and S matrix also in the denominator. So, now if I differentiate with respect to the source, I will end up uh, getting this so what is called the correlation function. It is this average, but then I have to subtract out the average uh, when I pair up these operators uh, in this way. So, so basically that is what it will uh, amount to. Okay. So, now, so in other words, this term that I was trying to uh, see if I can write in a way that involves only uh, one particle Green's function because after all, this has two particle uh, operators, it involves two op uh, creation and two annihilation. So, now I want to be able to express this in terms of something uh, involving only one particle. So, you see at the level of this equation, it is already clear that I have been successful in doing that because after all, what is this that I have circled here? It involves two creation and two annihilation, but here it involves only one creation because this is our my original green function which involves annihilation creation, but this also still involves annihilation creation, there is also one particle Green's function times and some other version of the one particle Green's function. So, there are all these are one particle versions of some products or whatever it is of some versions of one particle Green's function. So, that the two particle Green's function has now been expressed purely in terms of uh, some combination of one particle Green's functions. And that is an enormous advantage because you see now you can go ahead and I am not sure who crossed this out, it is uh, I mean this is, this is not meant to be crossed out, I certainly did not cross it out. Okay, uh, yeah. So, the point is that this uh, differential equation, so you see once you take this to this side, I can lump all this, uh, it, it becomes u plus this one. Uh, times this Green's function. Okay, so it it will just involve. So this is the original Green's function. This is basically G full, and this this will involve this sort of thing. So this is same as this, and this is the original G full. This is G full. So uh, I bring this to this side, and I I express only uh, this term in terms of this uh, plus this. And this plus this is basically the effective potential. So, it is like the average. So, what physically what this means is this is the average potential seen by a particle at R1, T1 not only due to the externally imposed source, but also due to all the other particles around it. So, this is the effective potential seen by the particle at R1, T1 but you do not have to call it that, I mean formally it is just this expression. So, the point is that formally you see uh, now I have succeeded in writing down the equation of motion for uh, the one particle Green's function uh, which is uh, which involves quantum particles that are not only have kinetic energy, but also a potential energy by way of mutual interaction between each other pairwise uh, potential energy. So, I have been successful in writing the Green's equation for the Green's function uh, in, in the form of a functional differential equation, uh, which only involves other versions of the one particle Green's function. So, in other words, it does not involve uh, equations, uh, it does not involve Green's functions uh, where the more than two particles are involved. So, bottom line is that uh, the price I have to pay to do that, uh, that is the price I have to pay to avoid introducing uh, four particle or, or rather two particle, three particle, four particle, etc. Green's function. So, the price I have to pay to uh, ensure that the equation for the Green's function only involves uh, one particle Green's function or some versions of the one particle Green's function. So, the price I have to pay is that I have to introduce artificially an external time dependent source uh, that is uh, defined along the imaginary axis. But then uh, you might say that uh, given that in the end it is not there, how do I get rid of it? 
So obviously the answer is that once you uh, somehow are successful in solving this equation, by the way nobody knows even now how to solve such equations. So these are functional differential equations which not only involve partial derivatives in the usual sense, but they also involve functional derivatives. So there is no, there is no well developed mathematical theory to solve this. It is just uh, you know writing this is uh, useful because it uh, allows you to develop perturbation scheme in a very systematic way because that is the only scheme we have uh, at our disposal to solve this because we just end up expanding in powers of this. So, you pretend there is a lambda here and you just expand in you expand your g's in powers of lambda and, and substitute and compare both sides and that sort of thing pretty much you that is all you can do. So, it this allows you to do that in a systematic way that is it. So, now the question is uh, how do I get rid of that external source? So, the answer is that if somehow you develop a perturbation scheme or whatever and truncate it in some main and so on and so forth, then you go ahead and set that external source to 0 and then you have gotten rid of it that way. Yeah, so that that is the whole point. So, this is called the Schwinger Dyson equation, Schwinger Dyson equation. Okay, so, uh, the rest of this chapter just tells you how to uh, implement that uh, perturbation scheme that I was talking about. So, basically you define a, something called the self energy. So, I think I am going to skip that because basically that is only if you are interested in actually carrying out that perturbation series in some systematic way. So, that you will end up with something called the GW approximation to the leading order. So, you, so your self energy can be expanded in powers of this coupling and the lowest order contribution is called the GW approximation which itself is pretty formidable and uh, it cannot be done. So, the whole thing is still non-linear even after, so the functional derivative aspect goes away at the first order. The moment you truncate you can get rid of the functional aspect of the problem, but then you still be forced to reckon with the non-linear partial integral differential aspect of the problem. So, it will remain an integral partial differential equation, yeah I mean it is kind of one runs out of adjectives to describe these sort of equations. So, bottom line is they are incredibly hard to solve and, and nobody even with present day computers even the GW approximation cannot be solved in any convincing way. Alright, so I am going to stop here as far as this particular topic is concerned. So, basically this particular topic was the Schwinger Dyson equation. So, the Schwinger Dyson equation is a functional differential equation for the time ordered Green's function of a system of particles interacting mutually and also with an external source that is defined on the imaginary time axis. So, um, it only involves the that Green's function, the one particle time ordered Green's function and nothing else. So, so that is as far as that topic is concerned. So, the this uh, the other topic that I have introduced in the next chapter is uh, some other simpler uh, versions of the non-equilibrium situation where uh, see earlier I was talking about a continuum problem where the degrees of freedom are truly infinite, but here I have uh, reverted to a system with a finite in fact just two level systems to just to tell you that uh, if you get rid of the field aspect of the question. That means, after all the title of this course is dynamics of classical and quantum fields. So, strictly speaking this part of the topics should not even have been there in the textbook, but it is there only because uh, it tries to tell you that if uh, already you know with uh, when systems are not in equilibrium. There is lot of interesting physics even at the level of finite number of degrees of freedom. So, there is something called Rabi oscillation and so on and so forth. So, you can have spontaneous stimulated emission etcetera. 
I am just introducing that just to highlight the fact that non-equilibrium systems are already reasonably complicated even when uh, you choose to study a system with finite number of degrees of freedom or uh, oscillators with just a uh, few labels. But then that would not be consistent with the title of the textbook which is dynamics of classical and quantum fields. So, let us get back to fields. So, so if I decide to get back to fields, the other topic I have to next discuss is basically the idea of coherent state path integrals. But as usual, you know, before I get to fields, I have to introduce the version of this uh, for a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom. So, usually that is how in fact, not usually that is that is the only way to do it. You introduce it for a finite and discrete number of degrees of freedom and then pretend that that index is now continuously large. Okay, so, what is this coherent state path integrals? So, if you remember we studied the quantum harmonic oscillator using the creation and annihilation uh, language. But, uh, that involves uh, that still involves dealing with the Hamiltonian. So, you see the Hamiltonian involves uh, creation and annihilation operators, but remember the, the spirit of the path integral approach. So, the spirit of the path integral approach is that you should be able to do quantum mechanics not merely with always with Hamiltonians, but you should also be able to do quantum mechanics using Lagrangians. So, now the question is you see now I have in front of me the harmonic quantum harmonic oscillator in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So, the question is uh, can I now write down the Lagrangian of the quantum harmonic oscillators not in terms of position and momentum, but in, again still in terms of creation and uh, I mean some. So, you see I want to dequantize the creation and annihilation operators, because after all you see in quantum mechanics the annihilation operator is basically an operator uh, which is in some sense complex, because it uh, is the complex uh, linear combination of two self adjoint operators. So, the question is you see uh, the, the dequantized version of the annihilation operator would simply be a, a complex number. So, now the question is I want to be able to see if I can introduce a path integral uh, approach to this problem in terms of the eigenvalues of the annihilation operator. So, so that is a peculiar point of view, but it is a it is a valid question to ask. You see there is the Hamiltonian is now expressed in terms of creation and annihilation operators. Now, remember how it is in the original path integral. So, if the original Hamiltonian was position and momentum uh, and they were operators the quantum mechanics of such a system using Lagrangians will involve actually the classical Lagrangian that means, it will involve e raise to i h bar integral d t of L, where L is the classical Lagrangian, where you have to in, uh, sum over all the classical paths. Uh, that means, all the, all the classical paths connecting some uh, initial and final endpoints. So, those classical paths will have some classical positions and classical velocities. So, similarly here you see I have a quantum Hamiltonian involving creation and annihilation operators. So, now if I want to uh, study this uh, using not the Hamiltonian uh, picture, but using Lagrangians, I will now be writing this uh, you know in terms of the path integral of the form uh, e raise to i uh, by h bar integral d t of L, where now L is the Lagrangian in terms of the dequantized versions of A and A dagger. Just like uh, in, in the case of path integrals I had to uh, write down the Lagrangian in terms of 
x and x dot which are x is basically the dequantized version of the position operator because now it is now a classical uh, object. So, similarly m x dot is the dequantized version of the momentum operator p. So, similarly here I want to be able to write down a dequantized version of a and a dagger so that I can express my Lagrangian in terms of those objects which would then correspond to the classical paths that the system is taking. So, clearly uh, those uh, are necessarily just like the dequantized version of the position operator is just the position eigen value. So, similarly the dequantized version of the creation operator is just the uh, eigen value of the creation operator which in this case happens to be complex. So, if I decide to introduce this then uh, I, I postulate that there has to be some state labeled by its Eigen value uh, z with a bar on top. Okay, so, that is uh, supposedly the uh, complex Eigen value of the creation operator. So, uh, the claim is that uh, if I decide to uh, define uh, the state uh, in this way that is this is indirectly the definition of the state basically it tells you uh, how the state comes about it is the Eigen state of the creation operator. So, now you can easily convince yourself that the Eigen state of the annihilation operator is uh, similarly given just I mean it is given by um, in this case it is given by multiplying that state by some z I mean it is Eigen value. So, basically it is the now an Eigen state. So, if this is the Eigen state of creation operator there is absolutely no reason why it should be the Eigen state of the annihilation operator also. So, in fact it is not. So, if you take the annihilation operator and act it on the state you will get a different state, but it so happens that that different state is obtained by simply differentiating that state with respect to the Eigen value. So, of course, you might think that this seems kind of completely out of the blue, how do I know this? So, I know this by because if I go ahead and uh, apply this claim uh, to this state rather than some other state, if I apply to this state. So, re remember I have claimed that A times this is basically this. Now, what is this? This is after all the Eigen state, so I can write it like this. So, first I do this. So, I, I first take A, act it on A dagger Z, but then what is A dagger Z? It is Z, uh, Z with a bar times Z uh, state Z with a bar. But if I do the reverse, so if I do the reverse, clearly uh, this particular state is, uh, yeah, so, so I will have to justify this, okay. So, yeah, so, this is not a very nice way of writing this. So, the bottom line is that you see uh, what is the claim? The claim is that if I act, uh, look just take this here, uh, you act this, uh, this is the claim, claim. So, if I act this uh, on A, uh, what is this supposed to be? It is supposed to be this. Okay. But then uh, what is uh, A dagger A? It is basically uh, 1 plus A A dagger uh, rather it is minus uh, see A A dagger minus A dagger A is 1 that is the commutator of A and A dagger is 1. So, it is uh, it is basically uh, so basically A dagger A is A A dagger minus 1. So, this is basically A A dagger minus 1 acting on Z state Z. Okay. So, the point is that uh, if I take this, so what is this? This is basically A acting uh, A, A A dagger acting on state Z minus state Z. But what is this one equal to? Uh, this is basically A acting on Z, Z minus state Z. Okay. So, now if I say that the action of this on, on this state is same as d by dz, 
then you see clearly yeah so this will clearly give me what I am looking for. So, a, the action of A on this state is same as acting this on that state. So, what is d by dz bar acting on this state? First it will act on this, it will give me z but that is getting cancelled by this. So, then this A will go and sit in the middle here. So, that is basically it will tell me it is z uh, A times uh, z. Okay. So, basically what it is saying is that uh, this particular state uh, so, so in other words, this is it is consistent with this identity. Okay. So, so the idea is that these two are consistent. But you can also uh, do it the other way. So, you can uh, introduce uh, a coherent state with respect to the eigenvalues of the annihilation operator rather than the creation operator. Okay. So, in that case, you can uh, go ahead and write this uh, this operator in terms of uh, uh, this uh, state which which is annihilated by A, and you can show that this is these two are consistent. So, I'm going to allow some some of these statements to be proved in the exercises, perhaps, because it's uh, it's kind of confusing for me to explain everything verbally. So, I think you just have to work it out. So, for example, here I have worked it out. So, if see the claim is that the, uh, so these are called coherent states for reasons I will again explain later on what is so coherent about it. So, the point is that uh, right now for our purposes, uh, it is just a state which is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator, for example, this one. See the earlier one was eigenstate of the creation operator. So, these two are, you know, in some sense dual to each other. So, the point is that this is the uh, eigenstate of the annihilation operator. So, the claim is that uh, this is this state can also be explicitly constructed this way. So, see we all know how to uh, what this means, this is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. So, it is annihilated by the annihilation operator. So, so what this says is that uh, you know formally expand this out in powers of z and act it on the ground state of the harmonic oscillator and whatever state you get is the coherent state. So, whatever state you get will be an eigenstate of the annihilation operator with this complex eigenvalue z. So, the question is how do we show that? So, you simply uh, write this in terms of a times this and then you do your normal uh, means you multiply and divide by this operator. And then you just expand in powers of z, you will see that all terms drop out except the linear term. The 0th power z to the power 0 survives, z to the power 1 survives, all others drop out because you know the commutator of. So, if you have a commutator of a and a dagger, it is just proportional to identity. So, all further commutators become 0. So, it is z to the power 0, z to the power 1. So, now if you work this out, it is simply this. So, that proves, it is very easy to prove this. So, basically this is the uh, eigenstate of the an uh, annihilation operator. So, it is the coherent state. So, you can also work out this overlap. You see, I told you that this state is the eigenstate of the creation operator. So, how how are they related? So, in, in the, they are related in a similar way to how uh, x and p states, remember how this is, it is e raise to i x p by h bar. So, if you have uh, eigenstate of momentum and eigenstate of position, these are somehow conjugates to each other and their uh, overlap is basically exponential of the two eigen product of the two eigen values. So, here also you get something similar. So, if you work this out, uh, you will see that the overlap of the eigenstate of the annihilation operator and the overlap of the eigenstate of the position. I mean, creation operator are very similar to overlap of position and momentum operators. That is basically the exponential of the product of the eigenvalues. But you can also go ahead and uh, prove completeness. So, uh, in, yeah, so there is something, uh, remember that there is something called completeness. So, if you have a set of, uh, if you have Hermitian operators, you can show that the uh, eigenstates of uh, a sulfur joint operator are complete in the sense that uh, you can write down a basis uh, in terms of those uh, 
uh, eigen states of such a self adjoint operator but uh, here a and a dagger are not self adjoint so they are actually complex so in some sense that contain more information than a self adjoint because self adjoint operators are in some sense real operators so here the it's a complex operator which has real and imaginary parts so the eigen states of this uh, are probably uh, there is probably a lot of, you can suspect that there will be a lot of duplicacy. That means that there will be unnecessary duplication of the states that they will not all be linearly independent. And in fact, that is in fact true. So, in fact, the eigenstates of uh, these operators are basically called uh, over complete. So, 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 if you want to introduce a resolution of identity the way you write like this. So, remember you write this sort of thing. So, if, if x is the position operator and this is the eigenstate of position, you, you can go ahead and write like this as a resolution of identity. So, you can do similar things with this, but then that means that you have to introduce a weight which compensates for the fact that these states are over complete. So, you can show that uh, this is how you have to resolve the identity. So, I will allow you to work this out in perhaps the exercises or, or if, if I do not get around to that you have to simply follow these steps. So, just follow all these steps. So, now see the original question I wanted to ask was answer was how do I study the Lagrangian version of the quantum particle using not x and p, but using creation and annihilation operators. See I know how to study the quantum harmonic oscillator using uh, the quantum versions of x and p. I know how to study the quantum quantum uh, harmonic oscillator using the classical versions of x and p, but in a path integral form. That means, you see I want to study only the quantum harmonic oscillator, I do not want to study classical harmonic oscillator, but if I want to study quantum harmonic oscillator using x and p operators, then of course, I have to use the Hamiltonian approach. But if I want to study the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator using Lagrangians, then I should use the classical Lagrangian, but I have to remember to do a path integral. That means that it is not no longer the Euler Lagrange equation, it is the sum over all paths with each path being weighted by an appropriate uh, factor which is proportional to. Uh, the exponential of the action multiplied by an imaginary unit divided by h bar. So, similarly here, now suppose I want to study the quantum harmonic oscillator using creation and annihilation operators, I would certainly be using the Hamiltonian approach. So, that has the advantage of immediately giving me the eigenvalues for free because it is just Hamiltonian is h bar omega into a dagger a plus half and a dagger a has integer eigenvalues, so it is n plus half. So, that is easy. So, but the question is suppose I want to study the quantum harmonic oscillator using the Lagrangian obtained from the Hamiltonian which is written down in terms of creation annihilation operators, not in terms of x and p. So, now, uh, so in other words the dequantized version of a and a dagger. So, how do I do that? So, that is what we are trying to answer. So, the answer to that is we have to develop a path integral approach, which now involves uh, the dequantized versions of the creation and annihilation operator which have simply complex numbers. So, I have to introduce, uh, so just like there I have to introduce the eigenstates of position and momentum to resolve the identity and insert a sequence of states in between. So, I divide up the time interval into small pieces and then insert identities by resolving identities and so on. 
I have to do the same here, but now I have to insert the resolution of identities in terms of the coherent states, which is why I require this over complete uh, resolution of the identities, uh, I mean resolution of the identity using coherent states. So, as usual uh, I start off with this question, if I want to calculate this Green's function of the system, this is what it is. So, uh, so now as usual I split this up into smaller pieces and uh, I end up getting, uh, yeah, so what is this H? So, remember H is basically H bar omega into A dagger A plus half. So, this H is, uh, this small letter H is H bar omega into A dagger A. So, this plus half omega I have put it outside. So, so that is anyway a constant factor. So, now you see I, I uh, write T F minus T I as uh, T F minus T I by N and uh, etcetera, etcetera. So, I, I split this up into many pieces, sigma uh, N pieces. So, that is what that is. So, and this will appear in the exponent. So, sigma uh, exponential sigma is the product. So, I will get product here. So, so, bottom line is that you see now I go ahead and insert my resolution of the identity that means this one and what is this one, this one. So, I keep inserting the resolution of the identity here and then I will give this get this over complete uh, weighting factor from here and then this is what this is. Okay. So, we are not done yet because I have to show that this is in some sense still uh, is related to the Lagrangian of the system. So, this gets multiplied by the rest of it. Okay. So, it is uh, it gets multiplied by this uh, successive terms. So, it is this is the over complete terms times the remaining. The remaining is this. Uh, so, this is similar to what we did earlier. So, here you see uh, the idea is the following because epsilon is small because what is epsilon is T f minus T i by n and n is very large. So, epsilon is small. So, this is approximately this. So, now if I go ahead and write it this way, then you can clearly show that since h is h bar omega into uh, a dagger a, this is clearly given by this. Uh, this so, this is the Eigen state of uh, a. So, therefore, it is just z, uh, z k plus 1. Right. So, and this is the eigen, eigen state of uh, uh, the other one. So, it is basically it gives you this. Okay. Yeah. So, it, it just gives you back this times this. So, this is the eigen value. So, this is just z, this is nothing but z k plus 1 into z k. This just gives you the eigen value. Similarly, this also just gives you the eigen value. So, clearly that it is equal to and what is this? This is equal to this these two are the same things. So, this overlap is basically remember I told you this is the overlap. So, the overlap of z and z bar is basically this one and that that appears here also is after the Eigen values come outside these two are the same things. So, that comes out. So, so this is again uh, you can re exponentiate because epsilon is small this is equal to this. So, now you can uh, go ahead and write it this way. Okay, So, it is going to be like this. Okay, so, then you identify this, uh, this discrete sum with basically a kind of a discretized version of an integral. So, uh, so to cut a long story short, if you discretize this integral, it gives you back this, this expression. So, I have done the reverse. You can start from here and get there. That is easier. So, discretize this integral, you will end up with this because the product is exponential of the sum. So, the thing is that now we may think of this as a Lagrangian of the system, okay? Because this has uh, the f uh, this is something like you know uh, p x dot minus l types. I mean, instead of p, you have z dash. Instead of x dot, you have z dot. This is l z z dash. So it's like that. So it's uh, z z bar minus l. And this is l, right? So it's omega into a dagger a. And a, a is a eigenvalue is z, a dagger's eigenvalue is z with a bar there. 
So, uh, so basically uh, that is the Lagrangian, your generalized coordinate is now z, z bar which is capital Z. So, that is your generalized coordinate. So, now you have to simply, so the Green's function can also be written as a coherent state path integral. So, this is the coherent state path integral. So, it is a path integral in terms of coherent states, ok. Yeah, so you might be thinking that why am I doing this because I can solve harmonic oscillator quite nicely using just uh, Hamiltonian approach. Why do I want a Lagrangian approach in the two in terms of creation and annihilation? Dequantized versions of the creation and annihilation operators. See, the reason for that is because in uh, uh, see all the modern relativistic quantum field theories are actually thought of as the current state path integral. Uh, so they are always phrased in terms of a current state path integral. So they are written in terms of. So, all your quantum electrodynamics, in, so you write them in terms of, so, but then for, for that I have to introduce the coherent state path integral for fermions. So, till now I have only, see this A, A dagger has this commutator is 1. I have to do coherent state path integral when the anti commutator is 1. So, that I will do next, but bottom line is that if once you are successful in doing this, then you can. Uh, put in a spatial dependence to make it fields and once you make it a field then you can describe you see electron field that is the uh, field of charged particles whose excitations of elect are electrons and then you can uh, express the uh, dynamics of such a field the quantum dynamics of such a field as a current state path integral over these fields now. So, that is nice because uh, it allows for a kind of a simpler description of you see the matter and forces uh, can be treated on an equal footing in a more elegant way uh, when you do that because uh, yeah, so I will not get into uh, the actual deeper motivations for why people do that, but you know once you start using it you will see its utility to some extent. But in the end it is true that many of these theories uh, are uh, you know I mean these uh, these kinds of uh, changes in perspective uh, are somewhat beneficial, but uh, in a very deep sense they are still very cosmetic because it is not as if you can solve for the properties of interacting systems simply by transforming your perspective from a Hamiltonian to a Lagrangian framework. So, the fundamental problems uh, namely that you are dealing with a strongly coupled system and so on that will still remain and there is nothing much you can do about it. So, okay, so in the, uh, so basically uh, what I have done next is I have shown you how to evaluate this path integral. So, remember in the case of quantum harmonic oscillator in terms of these uh, actual physical paths uh, x verse x as a function of time, I had shown how to evaluate the path integral from using some saddle point method. So, here also I should be able to show you that it can be evaluated and, and you get what you expect from traditional means in terms of the Green's function should agree with that. Uh, not only it should agree with the x and p path integral, it should agree with the Hamiltonian version of the Green's function also. So, I am going to spend the next lecture probably explaining to you how that comes about. But in the meanwhile, you should go ahead and read all this quite, I mean the technical details can be somewhat overwhelming because I do not know how much I can explain to you because all the steps are here. So, you should not complain that I have not explained because I have explicitly derived everything, nothing is missing. So, you just have to follow all the steps. So, if I even if I verbally describe what is going on, it will pretty much be just saying the same thing that you are seeing here. So, uh, so, you just have to go ahead and work this out, but the more interesting thing will be when I generalize all this to fermions, which is really the reason why people do this, because you can study matter fields and the fermionic coherent states are very peculiar. 
So, they involve the, the eigenvalues of uh, the annihilation operator uh, are not complex numbers, they are what are called Grassmann numbers and Grassmann numbers are uh, you know some anti-commuting versions of complex numbers. So, they are complex numbers of a very peculiar kind. So, there is a non-zero complex number whose square is 0. So, that seems like impossible, but actually that is what a Grassmann number is. So, you will be forced to introduce all these bizarre kinds of objects which are called Grassmann numbers and uh, so all your path integrals for fermions will involve that. And then finally, we will generalize to fields. So, when you generalize to fields, you will understand why I am doing all this or perhaps you won't, but certainly uh, you will get some inkling as to why I am doing this. So, once we are done with that, we will move on to my favorite topic which is uh, which is also my research area. So, you see most of the top uh, ideas uh, in the later chapters are pretty much uh, subjects I mean ideas from my own research works. So, I want to spend some time explaining all that because there are some very important questions that have to be answered uh, which have not yet been answered, but that is something I want uh, people listening to these lectures to be able to contribute and answer because I, uh, some of it uh, we are already making progress in some of those questions, but there are many questions which are still uh, largely unanswered. So, I need time to describe those issues uh, and that will conclude this course. Okay, I am going to stop now in the next class and try to wind up this uh, path integrals using coherent states. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.